Victor Grignard is best known for two things. One hell of a mustache he sports on every picture of him on the internet and the reaction named after him which earned him a Nobel Prize in 1912. Hey everyone, Victor is here, your guide to all things organic chemistry. The Grignard reaction is one of the powerhouses of organic chemistry and in this video we'll discuss the details of the Grignard reaction, how to approach it on the test and the common mistakes to avoid. So grab your cup of coffee and notebook to jot down the important parts, hit the like button for good luck on the test and let's get started! Before we jump into the discussion of the Grignard reaction and Grignard reactivity, let's talk about how we make the Grignard reagent itself and what exactly it is. We make the Grignard reagent by reacting an alkyl halide with magnesium shavings in anhydrous ether or tetrahydrofurane. The exact mechanism of this reaction goes beyond the scope of this tutorial, but if you really want to know, let me know in the comments below and I'll make a video about this mechanism as well. But in a nutshell, you can just remember that magnesium essentially inserts itself between the carbon and halogen atoms. From the reactivity perspective, the iodine and bromine containing halides are the most reactive. Chlorides are okay but not the best choice for the reagent and fluorides are compared comparatively unreactive, so you'll never see those in your course. In his original research, Victor Grignor used the isobutyl iodide as the example molecule. Another important thing to keep in mind is that we are virtually not limited by the nature of our alkyl halides at all. Your halide can be a simple chain with a halogen on an sp3 hybridized atom, or a complex molecule with a halogen on even an sp2 hybridized atom, it really doesn't matter. The sky is the limit here, making the Grignard reagent true a Swiss army knife of nuclear files. And when it comes to the Grignard reagent structure, things are not as simple as they may seem. Good news is, within the scope of a typical sophomore organic chemistry, we do not need to know the gory details of how the Grignard reagent really looks like. So we'll use a simplified approach to its structure, which works just fine for our purposes. So due to the direct carbon-magnesium bond, carbon atom has a very high electron density on it. The electronegativity of magnesium is about 1.3, while the electronegativity of carbon is roughly 2.5. This means that we have a very significant difference in the electronegativities making this bond so polar that it's basically an ionic bond at this point. So you can think of a Grignard reagent as essentially a carb anion in terms of its reactivity and overall behavior. Depending on how your textbook and your instructor wants to treat it, we can see it depicted as an ionic pair, which is uh, an oversimplification, a real oversimplification, or as a covalent compound uh, with the actual bond between carbon and magnesium, which is also not quite true, but closer to it. In this tutorial, I'll stick to the covalent bond depiction. And as I've mentioned earlier, due to the high electron density around the carbon atom and the carbon ionic character of the organic portion of the Grignard reagent itself, these substances are very basic and very nucleophilic. So first let's look at the acid-base properties of the Grignard reagent. Let's look at the reaction between the butyl magnesium bromide and a hypothetical acid of some sort. The pKa value of our conjugate acid in this reaction is going to be somewhere in the vicinity of 60. This means that anything with the pKa lower than that will be acidic enough to easily react with our Grignard reagent. If we look at all common acidic or maybe not so acidic species uh, that we commonly see in organic chemistry, such as carboxylic acids, alcohols, water, amines, or even terminal alkynes, they are all way too acidic to peacefully coexist uh, with the Grignard reagent, which means that when you are working with the Grignard reagent, you shouldn't have anything even remotely acidic anywhere to your system, which means that all these functional groups are a complete taboo in the presence of the Grignard. Remember, the proton transfer reactions, they have an extremely low activation barrier, so they will typically happen before anything else that can happen to your reagent. Agents. So if let's say you have a molecule with a carbonyl and an alcohol functional groups, the alcohol will react before the carbonyl. And this is also why we always emphasize the anhedrous conditions for the reaction, as water just kills the Grignard reagent. This is also a very common trick instructors love to implant into the tests, hoping that you just won't notice the acidic group and go with the nucleophilic attack instead. So always make sure to check for acid-based chemistry first. 
So now, if the acid-base chemistry is not an issue, we can actually talk about the namesake reaction itself. The Greenyard reaction truly revolutionized the field of organic chemistry when it was discovered. Victor Grignard discovered it in the 1900 as a part of his doctoral research, frankly. And uh, it was such a big deal that he got a Nobel Prize for it already in 1912. Just Think how cool it would be to get a Nobel Prize for your PhD work just, you know, 10 years after you get your PhD. <laughs> Most people barely have a tenure at that point in their career, but I digress. So what exactly is the Grignard reaction? Well, the classic Grignard reaction is the reaction between the Grignard reagent and a carbonyl like an aldehyde or a ketone, giving us a corresponding alcohol. And since the reaction is done in highly basic conditions, we'll initially end up with an alcohol oxide, which we will then protonate with the acidic workup. The reaction is extremely useful as it makes a new carbon-carbon bond, so you can easily construct complex molecules from simple ones. The resulting product is an alcohol, so you can then further functionalize your molecule using the alcohol chemistry. So let's look at the mechanism details of this reaction. Since the Grignard reagent is a strong nucleophile, it will readily react with electrophiles such as aldehydes and ketones. Here I have a reaction between butyl magnesium bromide and acetophenon. The reaction starts with the nucleophilic attack from the Grignard reagent onto the carbonyl. Traditionally, we show it by taking the electrons from the carbon-magnesium bond and pushing them towards the carbon of the carbonyl. However, if your instructor likes to show it as carbanion, uh, we'll then show the electron pair on the carbon atom instead of the uh, covalent bond between the carbon and magnesium. As I've mentioned before, I'll stick to the bond version of the mechanism. Here is one other thing I want you to keep in mind. Since carbon of the carbonyl is already fully satisfied with the electrons and has a full octet, we cannot just add those electrons to it and make a new bond. If we want that carbon to accept those electrons from our Grignard reagent, it needs to push some electrons away. And that is precisely what it does uh, with the pi bond of the oxygen. Remember to do that when you're working through the mechanism of this reaction or you will end up with a carbon with too many bonds. After the nucleophilic attack on our carbonyl, you should always have the O-. This step makes a new carbon-carbon bond and a negatively charged oxygen. That part is something that should be always a check that you go through whenever you're doing this reaction. In the next step, we're going to do the acidic workup protonating the O-. The acidic workup is always going to be the second step on this reaction. Some instructors skip it or assume it, but it is always going to be there even if they don't show it. Also, in this case, the resulting alcohol is going to be chiral. At this point in your course, your instructor will most likely expect you to indicate the stereochemistry of your products, well, when it is relevant, of course. So make sure you do so and don't forget about that. Here, if I wanted to indicate the stereochemistry, I would either write that my molecule is racemic, like that, or I would show both stereoisomers, uh, which are enantiomers in this particular case. Okay, let's look at another example. In this case, we're reacting the phenyl magnesium bromide with pentane 3 ion or 3 pentanone if you like. This reaction makes a tertiary alcohol similar to the last example. However, in this case, we're going to get an achiral molecule. And the mechanism is going to be very similar to the previous example as well. We'll start by attacking our carbonyl, making a new carbon-carbon bond, and once that part is done, we'll protonate our molecule with the acidic workup step. So if the reaction with the ketone gives us a tertiary alcohol, well, how would this reaction proceed with an aldehyde? Well, a reaction with an aldehyde gives us a secondary alcohol instead. For instance, in this reaction, if I do the reaction between methyl magnesium bromide with butanol, we are going to get pentane to all after the acidic workup. And this molecule is also chiral, so I would say that it is either racemic or I will show both possible stereoisomers. The Grignard reagent can react with a whole range of various electrophiles. Another common example is going to be the reaction with esters and acid chlorides. 
If I take a Grignard reagent, butyl magnesium bromide here, and react it with, for instance, benzoyl chloride, the first step in this reaction is going to be exactly what we would expect from it, the nucleophilic attack on the carbon of the carbonyl. However, we now have a leaving group, which can be easily pushed away from our molecule. This is going to recreate the CO double bond and reaction can happen one more time. So the next equivalent of butyl magnesium bromide will come in and attack again. This makes another carbon-carbon bond yielding the alkoxide like if we did this reaction with a ketone. And only after that would be able to do our acidic workup, giving us the tertiary alcohol as the final product. So important thing to remember here is that the Grignard reaction with acid chloride happens twice. And for as long as you are working with a simple Grignard reagent, you won't be able to stop it after the first round of addition. There are, of course, ways how we can prevent it, but it would require special conditions and additional components in our reaction mixture, which just goes beyond the scope of this tutorial. Alright, so what about esters? Well, the reaction proceeds in a very similar fashion. If I treat ethyl acetate with phenyl magnesium bromide, I'll first do the initial round of the addition giving me the negatively charged intermediate. That intermediate will push away the alkoxide leaving group, restoring the carbonyl and the reaction can happen one more time. With another equivalent of phenyl magnesium bromide that comes in and attacks my carbonyl again, eventually giving me a tertiary alcohol as a final product. So the idea here is the same. Reaction happens twice and you end up with a tertiary alcohol. And while there are other variations of this reaction with carboxylic acid derivatives, I'll limit our discussion here just to these two reactions. But you will also learn how the Grignard reagent reacts with nitriles and amides later in your course as well. Another variation of the Grignard reaction uh, that you are very likely going to see in your course is going to be the reaction with an epoxide. This is a useful reaction from the synthetic perspective as it can give a new carbon-carbon bond one carbon away from the OH group uh, and in the resulting alcohol. So if I react the phenyl magnesium bromide with a 2,2-dimethyl oxirane, I'm going to attack the less substituted carbon of my epoxide, which is a common trend for all epoxide openings with strong nucleophiles. This is going to create a new carbon-carbon bond opening the epoxide ring, and since the oxygen is still connected to the other atom, it makes an alkoxide with the oxygen that is one atom removed from the place where we have attached our Grignard reagent. And of course, here, like in any of these reactions, we'll need to do an acidic workup to protonate the resulting anionic species. The Grignard reaction is an incredibly versatile method of making new carbon-carbon bonds. For many years, it was the premier method of carbon-carbon bond formation, and this reaction made such a profound impact on the field of organic chemistry that the early 1900s to about 1960 is known as the Grignard era of organic chemistry. And while this reaction is over 120 years Years old, it is still regularly used in the modern research and synthetic strategies in organic chemistry. It's also going to be one of the premier carbon-carbon bond making uh, methods in your course. So whenever you're looking at a synthesis problem and see that there was a new carbon-carbon bond added to your molecule, chances are the key step in that synthesis is going to be the Grignard reaction. Thank you for watching. I want to especially thank all Organic Chemistry Tutor members and my generous sponsors for your continuous support and encouragement. If you learned something new today, give this video a like, share and subscribe subscribe to the channel for daily organic chemistry updates. Leave me your questions and feedbacks in the comments below, watch this video next, and I will see you tomorrow!